morning. It's a turn to um, sing together, and we are going to take that from SSNS this morning, beginning with hymn number 590, 590. That's what we're going to start with. We are going to have all the three verses. We will, of course, like to appreciate the choir on that lovely rendition on um, a medley of consecration related songs. And prior to that, we have the mixed quartet, sorry, mixed trio from the Odola Jazz um, visiting us from um, New York, USA, on Amazing Grace. We really appreciate all those um, contributions to the prelude. It's our turn to blend our voices and um, see whether which you will be able to match what we have enjoyed thus far. 590, we're taking all the three verses and a couple of more other songs that we follow. And for our song leading, this morning we have Brother Delight. Six, 616 again in the same hymn book we're going to take the first and the third verse while seated 616 we'll take just the first and the third verse while seated take my silver and my gold not a mite would I withhold take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose
607. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it's all thy love to me. We're going to sing the first, the third, the first, the second, and the third verse again while seated. 607, verses 1, 2, and 3. Our song before prayer will be 577, SS and S, 577. Um, we'll take the first and the second verse while seated. And uh, for those of us that can stand, we will uh, rise up to, to sing the fifth verse and remain standing uh, to be led in prayer. So 577, we'll take verse one, verse two, and we'll rise up for the fifth verse. Shall we ask our orchestra to join us uh, for the uh, chorus at the end. We will repeat the chorus and we'll ask our musicians uh, to join us to sing that together.
remain standing and our eyes closed, we call on our Superintendent General to please lead us in congregational prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the privilege we have to approach the throne of grace this morning. We thank You, Lord, that we can confess we need Thee. We need Thee every hour. We're thankful we have the promise and the assurance that You're with us every hour. We pray that your presence will continue to abide with us Amen. during this hour as we look to thee in one accord with consecrated hearts and minds. We ask, Lord, that you sanctify the teaching Amen. and the testimonies that precede it. Amen. Thank you for blessing the music Amen. and around the place of prayer that you will meet with every heart. We know that you're here to hear prayer, but not only to hear our prayers, but to answer them. God bless each one in our company. We'll give you thanks. For we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're welcome again to our second Bible teaching for this kind of meeting. We thank the Lord for what he has done so far. And perhaps before I um, continue with the announcement, of course, you have seen Brother Darrell. Um, we did pray that the Lord will bring them to us safely. That is Brother Darrell and uh, Sister Debbie. And I'm happy to announce that they are with us now. Um, thank you so much for your prayers. Um, we're going to sing for our um, testimony service from the same hymn book that we are singing from. And that's going to be number two, number two, A Mighty Fortress. But before then, let me just quickly remind you <clears throat> of the activities that we have in our schedule. Um, there's going to be children's choir practice at 2 in preparation for the children's church at 3. So it's going to be here at 2 p.m. for children's um, choir and orchestra practice, children's church at 3. And then uh, the evening meeting at this location, 7.30 in the evening. And for Wednesday, um, there's nothing in the morning as we usually have a time for um, a break. So we're going to have that break tomorrow morning and then the next um, service will be the evening service um, Monday night. But on Thursday and Friday, Bible teachings will continue at the same time, 10 in the morning on each day and revival service 7.30 on those days um, as well. One announcement here too for our first timers and the international guests. All first timers and all international guests. Um, it is the usual practice of our welfare department of the church to have a reception for these groups. So please, they would like me to announce to you that tomorrow at 4 p.m., just in case some are going out, to have that in mind, that you should please uh, be back for that reception at 4 p.m., which is going to be um, the back of the auditorium, I think the main, at the back of this place where we are meeting just somewhere there. Once you are just around here, the ushers will be glad to direct you to, um, to that location. We announced yesterday that we are doing this um, kitchen work, station by station. The Peckham Saints gave us that um, good example they got pass mark from the people looking after the uh, kitchen. So it's going to be the um, turn of uh, Bexley branch, Bexley branch, um, and that is everybody, everybody. Um, when you get there, if they need to ask you to go and sit down, um, they ask you to go and sit down. Please, if anyone will see um, Brother Ola or Francis, um, um, pushing the trolley, don't worry them. Some of you worried me yesterday as I was pushing trolley around. You don't need to worry. And I love the way some of you took it, especially the young people. God bless the young people. They were just packing and giving me, take, take, take. And I was just taking. But for the adults, it's like you can't come to me. It's not yet time. Um, um, please, let, let us just... Um, Give that a chance. It works very well like that, isn't it? So let us do that. The Bexley Saints, and if you see any of the Bexley Saints sitting near you when others are working, tell him to get up 
and join um, the group that are working. Okay, testimony service. Uh, we start with uh, singing together hymn number two, Our Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's take two verses, verses one and the third, verses one and the third, and then the um, floor will be open to two minutes testimony. Let's remember that. Um, we have um, Bra Mike and Bra Godwin ready today. If you've been enjoying some time before now, uh, they have now been giving some advice. At, at the end of two minutes, something will be playing softly to tell you to please round up and then um, to give others um, the chance to continue. God bless you, Brad Delight. my soul at the age of 17 and sanctifying me and baptizing me with the Holy Ghost and fire. It's been a privilege to save God uh, and I'm truly honored uh, to, to be at this care meeting uh, with someone I call my mother who raised me and taught me uh, you know, to, to go this old fashioned way. Uh, it hasn't always been easy but Jesus has been faithful. Um, for, for almost three years now, I've been praying for my family to come and join me uh, in the UK. And right at the beginning of, of this care meeting, God has answered my prayer. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I look forward to next year, should the Lord tarry, you know, to, to, to worship together with my family. Uh, uh, do play, pray for me that at the end of it all, I make heaven my home. I thank God for Jesus. Um, 50 years ago, in 1967. Thank you, Sister Dupe. Oh. Bonolo, please. I want to thank the Lord this morning for his love and grace on my soul. I thank the Lord who saved my soul. I thank the Lord who allowed me to be here at camp meeting. I came with so much load, with so much pain. But I want to thank the Lord because he's faithful. Amen. Just from the first service, he took me back to the basics. He has blessed me so much. He has taken off that load. He has given me peace. He has given me joy. You know, just after the youth service, when I was praying, I had this terrible migraine attack. I've, I've been having them quite often. I went to do a CT scan two months back, and you know the doctor said, everything is normal. We don't know what the problem is. You know, 
My jaws went stiff, I couldn't talk. I went numb the whole of my side. I said, God, here am I before you. I want to thank the Lord because he's my healer. Amen. The doctors don't know what the problem is. It's been so hard. Yesterday I couldn't even sit nicely because my whole neck was so stiff. But I said, God, thank you. I'm at camp meeting and I believe the Lord will heal me. If he doesn't heal me, I want to go to heaven because there will be no sickness there. I thank the Lord because he's blessing me with every service, with every sermon I hear. You know, he just brings me to prayer. I want to go back rejoicing. I praise his name. Thank God for because of last month my grandpa was sick and then he wanted to die but when we prayed in the evening and when we woke up he was healed and he Amen. felt better. That's why I wanted to testify. Amen. Thank the Lord. Okay, sorry for this. Uh, Sister Dupe, I didn't stop you. I want this our visitor all the way from Botswana to, for us to give her the chance. So can we listen to Sister Dupe? And at the end of that, we listen to the first special old-fashioned meeting. One of the choir will start that. And then Sister Shike, we are not forgetting you. Once after a choir member has testified after that song, then Sister Shike and others can join. And then we're going to have the last special, which is a solo submission before our teaching this morning by Ola Balogo. I thank God. I thank God for the blood of Jesus that redeemed me from my life of sin. Um, 50 years ago, in 1967, my parents made the decision to bring the whole family to the Apostolic Faith Church. Um, we, the children, when we came, we so much loved the church because... Um, Apart from the uh, organ that my dad played, that was our first time of seeing so many musical instruments. So we were so thrilled that uh, even in our neighborhood, our friends knew that uh, we had changed church because we would gather them together and we would uh, play the church. We had sticks and uh, our voices as musical instruments and it was so wonderful but one day one glorious day um god cornered me up god you know i prayed i confessed my sins and jesus saved my soul Amen. i thank god i prayed again jesus sanctified me Amen. at sanctification he actually uprooted the fighting spirit that i was born with I praise God for that. And he filled me with power for service. I thank God. Um, um, my, my case is like that of David, that uh, in Psalm 37 verse 25, that I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I thank God that God has always supplied my need and I didn't have to beg for bread. The journey has been so full of the ups and downs of life. But through it all, I purposed in my heart that I will not mess up. I purposed in my heart that um, I would always follow the path of holiness. I purposed in my heart that I would always seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God in return always shows me mercy. I pray that God will continue to show me mercy till I see him face to face. Pray for me.
I began to pray, and God help me and send me in the old fashioned way. There was singing, such singing of those old fashioned airs. There was power, such power in those old fashioned prayers. And old fashioned conviction made the sinner pray. And the Lord even saved him in the old fashioned way. T'was an old fashioned meeting in an old fashioned place. When some old fashioned people had some old fashioned grace. As an old fashioned sinner, I began to pray. And God help me and save me in the old fashioned way. Well, they say it is better. Things have changed, don't you know? And the people in general seem to think it is so. And they call me old fashioned when I dare to say that I like it far better in the old fashioned way. And I hope you do too. Yes. If the Lord never changes as the fashions of men, if it's always the same why he is old fashioned then, as an old fashioned sinner saved through all time grace, so I'm sure he will take me to an old fashioned place. T'was an old fashioned meeting in an old fashioned place with some old fashioned people and some old fashioned grace. As an old fashioned sinner, I began to pray. And God help me and save me in the old fashioned way. T'was an old fashioned meeting in an old fashioned place. With some old fashioned people and some old fashioned grace. As an old fashioned sinner, I began to pray. And God help me and save me. with the Holy Ghost and fire. I want to thank him that apart from healing our body, the Lord can heal our mind also. At just after the camp meeting last year, I was kind of struck with them. With, it was just my mind. I was kind of, it was a, a terrible depression. I didn't know where it came from, but I thank the Lord that I was just crying unto God. Have mercy upon me. But God, God had mercy. I was holding on to him. God just healed my mind. I didn't know where it came from. I mean, it was not after that. I mean, just about that, Brabanji preached something about the mind, and I held on to that, and I was praying, Lord, heal my mind. And the Lord did it. If before the end of the year, the Lord healed my mind. Amen. Before then, I was, had been out of job, and I had prayed. I knew God had, I knew he had had, but it didn't come, to, nothing was coming through. So I left everything to God. At the beginning of this year, I listed all the places I had been, and I said, God, this is enough. I'm not, if it's not coming, that's the end of it. And I told my husband, I'm changing my career. And I, I applied to the uni. <laughs> it, it was a complete, a complete course. Thank God, I, I approached one of the uncles yeah, in the Lord, and they gave me a reference. And lo and behold, God gave me an admission. And out of the blue, the job that I had forgotten about in two weeks, I had two offers. Amen. It was amazing. How God did it, I don't know. One of them, it was, they just saw me, my CV somewhere, I said, we have this job, are you interested? I said, why not? I want to interest. It is a company I would never have applied to. But God did it wonderfully. In a week, the job was there. I thank the Lord for what he can do.
completely. I want to thank God for this camp meeting. It seems as if we were not going to make it this year. But the, God, but the Lord which I worshipped, I know he paved the way for us to be here. I want to thank God for everything he has done in my life. I can't even thank him enough because his blessings are so much for me to count. I want to thank him for everything. Praise God. I had the privilege of the gospel, but I wasn't a Christian. I didn't even have the mind to serve God. And uh, when I was uh, a bit uh, very young, I, my father passed to eternity, and life became uh, very dark. But I praise God this uh, morning that the uh, God of the gospel has been all enough for me. Uh, at one point in time in my life, God made me to realize that the life of sin is not going to help me. And I prayed, God changed my life. Amen. There is one thing why I love this gospel. There is power in the gospel. Yes. The power that can change life. Yes. A bad boy of yesterday can be a good boy. Yes. And that is what the gospel is. Yes. And I praise God for this. Yes. I thank God for all other Christian experiences in my life. But why I got up this morning uh, is that uh, last year come meeting, I came here with my wife. And while, before we came, we had prayer requests that we penciled down as a family that we are taking this to God in prayer at the camp meeting. Do you know, God answered all of them. Amen. God is faithful. Yes. And I will say one of the answers to the prayers of, 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 my pray, of our prayers. Uh, we, before we came, we applied to the immigration for our daughter to join us. And lo and behold, the immigration wrote to me in response of that, that at the point in time, in September 2015, I overworked. Ah, that I should explain. But do you know that verse of the Bible that says, uh, when we were brought before councils, it's going to tell us what to speak. I took the letter on the news of prayer. I said, God, teach us what we are going to say. And God taught us what to say. And we explain ourselves as honest as God has placed it in our mind. Do you know, we kept praying. My, mind, my wife was worried. Maybe they are going to say we should leave the country. I said, don't worry about that. Even if they say we should leave, God is in control. Yeah. Wherever I want us to be, we will go. And we came to our meeting. We told God. We went back. My wife would tell me, ask them. I said, don't worry. But one day, on the 8th of August, even at the car meeting, the Spirit of God told me, when it is on the 8th of August, call immigration. Even before then, I was scared to call because I didn't know what's going to happen. But we prayed. And on the 8th of August, I called them. They said, okay, just hold on. You will get an answer from us. That same day, at 4 p.m., I just got an SMS from them that they have approved the application of our daughter. And that was how our daughter joined us. I praise the name of God. There is all answers on our news of prayers. I want to get to heaven. I love this gospel. And I want God to help me. given unto me. I thank God for the privilege that I was born in the gospel and raised in the gospel. And uh, when I was very, very young, the Lord saved my soul. He sanctified me and baptized me with the Holy Ghost. Since then, God has been taking care of me. He has been holding out to me. And uh, when it was time for me to get married, I pray and God answered my prayer. Uh, when I was about to join my husband in UK, they said to me that marriage is a pursuit Behold, when I came here, I opened the past, my home parcel. My home parcel is full of everything. You know, I just said to God, what was all this? But the Lord assured me that he's going to stay with me. And God helped me. You know, it has not been easy at all. But God puts a smile in our face. And together, God has been helping us. Throughout the crisis, God has been holding her. You may be looking at us and see we don't have problems. We have lots of problems. But God has been holding her. God make us to depend on him for 
everything. Just talk of everything. Financially, we depend on God. You may see us looking for it based on God. We thank God for this. I thank God on behalf of my children. God has been taking good care of us. God has been holding her for us. And I just want you to pray with us. We want to get to heaven. We thank you for keeping us in the gospel. We thank you for helping us. It is not by might. It is not by everything. Even the dad and mom, they've gone to heaven. And I made a promise that I want to serve the God of my father. You pray for us so that we can get to heaven. Amen. To thank God for helping me with my exam. Because I was really worried about it in school. But I just thank God for helping me and they passed. Yeah. Through the past four years, it's been... Uh, it's been a journey um, from my first year of university and uh, up till this day. Lord has directed me. Um, it's not been, you know, just going to uni every day and all that. I've had to, you know, move universities and uh, God has blessed me. And on my fourth year, I, uh, I graduated this last two weeks. And, uh, you know, God provided me with three jobs before I finished university. So um, I thank God for everything he has done. Amen. I want to thank God today because I am saved. Amen. I am sanctified and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. It's been a long time I've wanted to say those words because I've heard about salvation. I've heard about sanctification. I've heard about the Holy Ghost on fire. But sanctification, God... What is this? People have explained it. I've heard it over and over again. But God, am I sanctified? I didn't know. I didn't know. God, help me. I just prayed after um, the uh, Sunday service. I said, God, this sanctification, I want it. I just want it because I need it. I, just, I was praying, 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 God, sanctify me. After some time, it said, go to the um, altar there. I took off my cardigan. I was sweating. I said, God, you have to sanctify me. He sanctified me there by God's yeah. grace. Thank God for that. Then I said, God, I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. Yesterday morning, after Brother Mike um, preached that we need to have everything to, um, to go to heaven. I said, well, God, I've been saved. I've been sanctified. I need the third one now. My stomach was aching me. I was hungry. I was tired. I said, God, this is this just no. I have to do this now. I didn't go to the altar. Right over here, I prayed, God, you have to fill me. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I thank God for that. It was, it was just such a change. Before, when I'm praying, I would just pray for about 10, 15 minutes. I'll get up and I'll go because, well, I just, you know, this, uh, yesterday, two and a half hours I was praying. God, I thank God for that, for filling me, for having the hunger to pray to God for other people as well. I praise God. Yeah. So let 
let him bid me go or stay. The cross that I must bear, if I a crown would wear, is not the cross that I would take. But since on me it is laid, I'll take it unafraid and bear it for the master's sake. Not what I wish to be, nor where I wish to go, for who am I that I should choose my way? The Lord shall choose for me. Tis better far, I know. So let him bid me go or stay. Submission to the will of him who guides me still is surety of his love revealed. My soul shall rise above this world in which I move. I conquer only where I yield not what I wish to be, nor where I wish to go. For who am I that I should choose my way? The Lord shall choose for me. Tis better far, I know. So let him bid me go or stay. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to. For our opening text, we'll read from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. We'll read again chapter 3, verse 8. And we'll combine that with Revelation 4, 11. Just those three verses quickly. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And Revelation 4, 11. It says, Thou art worthy O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. Amen. Well, we'll be looking this morning at the topic of consecration. But I thought um, those beginning the scriptures we just read now can help us to kind of set the context in terms of the relationship between man and and God. When I say man, it means man, woman, and God right from the outset. But before then, perhaps maybe we just kind of look at that word consecration. I mean, it's a big word. Um, for those perhaps maybe in the apostolic faith um, circles, it's probably a familiar word. When you talk about consecration, to consecrate, it means to offer. Perhaps maybe we relate it to the individual now, to us as individuals, is to offer oneself to devote oneself or to fully yield oneself 
of course, in this context, to God, or to completely surrender, yeah. or you might say to set apart for some holy purpose. So basically, we're trying to look at, you know, let's try and kind of internalize the teaching in terms of, you know, I want to devote myself. I want to yield myself. I want to completely surrender myself um, to God or set myself apart for some holy purpose. But the reason why I, we read those scriptures was, I think I believe, and from what we've seen in scriptures, consecration is not a daunting word. It's a pleasurable word. It's not a negative word. It's actually a positive word. It's not something that's forced upon us. It's something that we voluntarily or freely do. That's very, very important to be able to kind of see that. And from what we've been seeing from the move of the Spirit through this camp, we've already we're beginning, we've been seeing a lots and lots of us who have been kind of consecrating our lives. And it's something that's been kind of just been prompted by the Holy Spirit. Now, from the very outset, when God created us, we read in the scriptures, Genesis 2, 7, God decided to create man and breathe in him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Right. And in Genesis 3, 8, we then read about something a bit disastrous happened. But I think the initial part of that verse was saying, God came to meet with Adam and Eve in the evening in, the, in Eden where he kept them in the cool of the day. But there's something happened. I think before the last phrase of that verse, they kind of enjoyed some good relationship. There was some kind of emotional attachment between God and man that they just kind of enjoyed each other. The relationship was just perfect. It was superb. It was just fantastic and they enjoyed it. But because for some reason they disobeyed, which we know the story very well, there was a bit of a problem. They said they hid themselves from God at that point in time. But the key here is in Revelation 4.11, again, we talked about, said thou, hast, um, <clears throat> said thou art worthy, O Lord, that God is really worthy, yeah. that everything he created was for his own pleasure. They are and were created. So we need to understand that before the fall, God's intention is what he did was perfect. I mean, we can see in terms of we can see um, nature, we can see what God created. It's just superb, isn't it? Look at the landscape in Wales. Look at the greenery. Look at everything. It's something that's just so marvelous. That's God. And in that whole plan of God, he had a plan for us to, to just kind of just make things just so pleasurable for us. But sin came into the picture, and that's what caused a little bit of a problem, or a big problem, actually. So God designed us so that ex experiences love is the most pleasurable reality available to the human makeup. So we need to understand that although there has been a problem, but God, we should find that, don't feel that becoming a Christian or being consecrated is something that is going to be forced on us. Or it's something that's going to mean, oh, my life is going to be miserable. No, that's not God's intention at all. God's intention is to have a good time with us. Yeah. is to have a pleasurable time all the way through. And those who've actually been experiencing that can attest um, to that. So when we do not love God with a passionate heart, then our emotional life is out of balance. Put it that way. If in our Christianity we don't really love God, whereby I, I think I remember it was Anna's testimony yesterday that you can feel a heartbeat, that there, there is an emotional attachment between her and God. Somehow she just felt just that there's so, so much love in her soul towards that. That makes Christianity attractive, doesn't it? And that's what it's designed to be. That is designed to be such a pleasurable experience. So... But the key here is there was some kind of wholeheartedness in terms of that relationship. The whole of Adam, the whole of Eve, just in a very fluid, organic way, they just kind of enjoyed God. They just kind of really had a pleasurable time with God. But that kind of happened. So for them to get back, it requires wholeheartedness. It requires the whole of them to kind of link back to God. And consecration 
when the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary was to reconcile us back to God, isn't it? And consecration is purely designed to kind of reestablish that kind of pleasurable experience. It's what we need to do to kind of enjoy that which Adam and Eve enjoyed. Of course, we're not talking about Adamic perfection, but you understand what I'm saying, to kind of enjoy that which our soul is longing for, that which we really want, you know, that kind of thing which um, our soul is really um, gunning for. So consecration became a necessity in order to reestablish the pleasurable relationship with God. So that is the essence of consecration. So if there's one thing, if God will help us today is that consec- to, to take home is consecration is voluntary. It really is. Vo- it's something you voluntarily just do. So don't feel it's something that God, it, one, one good thing about serving God, especially with the New Testament dispensation is everything is prompted by the Holy Spirit and we kind of respond in love. And that's what makes Christianity really so beautiful. And so wonderful. You see, one of the things that motivated, I remember mean, some of us that went to Portland camp meeting, and of course, we thank God for technology. A lot of us have been falling online. Some of the things in my notes when I was writing down that really, I remember the first um, sermon on the Sunday when we talked about the goodly heritage we have. And as the whole sermon was unfolding, one thing that occurred to me while I was meditating was without consecrated people, we wouldn't have had a goodly heritage. It's because there were people who were fully consecrated. So that makes consecration a really big, huge, overarching landmark. When we talk about the ancient landmarks, consecration for me is overarching. It's an overarching landmark, and it really makes the gospel beautiful. I remember Brother Joe Bishop preached on um, the, um, he preached a wonderful teaching on, on absolute truth, the importance of absolute truth. And he talked about without having absolute truth, it's going to be impossible to combat some of the partial truths in society or even in the religious world today. And consecration, understanding and fully submitting to consecration is absolute truth. It's something that will really save us and it's something wonderful. I remember the teaching again on apostolic Christianity that was by Brother Jack and Chastine. And one of the things he said that we Christians are mandated from God to live a Christ-like life. And that mandate that we get from God to live a Christ-like life makes us apostolic. That is why we can say we are apostolic Christians. But the root to living that kind of life is consecration. Without full consecration, it's not going to be possible to live that kind of um, life. And, you know, there's so much that when in, in terms of um, some of the things we can we can point to, you know, I, I remember, I mean, I have testimony, what sister talked about, I was testifying just a few minutes ago, and referring back to her dad, there are some who mentioned about maybe second generation, I remember um, in Portland, there were some people talk about third, fourth generation of, you know, my great grandfather, my great this and that, it's because we had someone consecrated their lives fully to God, without that, there wouldn't have been that generation flow, so consecration is the key to actually get the gospel to continue. Con- without the consecration, the gospel will not survive. With consecration, the gospel will thrive. When we have consecrated people, the gospel will thrive and it will actually be so wonderful even in these last days. You know, um, the consecration literally, we'll be, we'll be looking at um, how, where it starts from, but primarily we are looking in the context of those who have been reconciled to God. Of course, there's something that happens. If we read 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it said, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He said, we are bought with a price. Simply imagine that when we're reconciled with, to God, you're literally saying, God, perhaps Satan had a part of me or a whole of me before. Now, you've got me back. I am truly and fully yours. You're literally voluntarily giving yourself back to its owner. That's what we're doing when we acknowledge the fact that we are bought with a price. We are effectively consecrating our lives in a very voluntary way. Romans 14.8 says, For whether we live, 
We live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Amen. Can you see that? Consecrate people say, look, I am just yours, God. Just deal with me as thou seest me. I am thine, O Lord. Do you remember the song we sang? We're literally saying, I am truly and fully yours. That is what consecration actually produces. Now, consecration is the root of everything we receive from God. Anything and everything we receive from God comes through consecration. Without consecration, we cannot receive anything from God. And it's initiated by the love of God. It's, that's the initiation of it. It's initiated by the love of God, by the love of God. When a sinner comes to, 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 to Christ, you know, one of the fruits of the Spirit, that means when we're born again, they say love, isn't it? The love of God actually is in our soul. And in Matthew 13, 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buy up that field. I mean, you will imagine, it seems the kingdom of God is, you imagine someone that um, suddenly felt that, I have found the golden way. I have found something superb. When they got saved, when they got saved, they said, wow, what is this? And they were likening it to someone who actually found a treasure and sold everything you had. Everything you fought for, you sought for. Everything that yourself will kind of, you said, look, actually, I'm going to abandon all that. I don't mean literal abandonment. You know what I mean? It's literally saying, God, I now, you take over now. Amen. You actually have my life completely. That is what um, consecration and that really is epitomized there you can see that voluntary act there it's just something that really comes which naturally comes from the soul and um, we know Moses with uh, there was this said about Moses in Hebrews eleven twenty six. esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward and imagine someone that was raised up in the palace someone raised up Pharaoh you know the then Egypt then was actually the the, the main superpower of the then world. Moses had that privilege of being raised there, but then he esteemed the reproaches of Christ. Having tasted the riches in Christ, he said, look, that's more important. And that is a statement of consecration. He literally said, I would rather suffer with the people of God rather than, than to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt. Again, there's a voluntary act there. Can you see that? It was just something that Moses just freely said, look, I would rather go into the wilderness for 40 years, suffer there, whatever, than to kind of enjoy the pleasures of Egypt. That is... Um, um, consecration. Now, when we get saved, as I said, there is a measure. There, there is a measure of consecration that happens there. But normally, I mean, I think in the UK we studied recently about this whole tabernacle, you know, kind of um, worship. When we're looking at the various compartments there, do you remember we talked about the brazen altar, which typifies the salvation experience? Bringing a trespass offering, you confess your sins, you get saved through that process. The actual act of confessing and forsaking and getting saved is something that's not consecration. That's something you need to do to get your peace back with God. But remember, a number of us, while we do that, even when we're praying, we're actually promising God that if you can but save me, my entire life is yours. That's consecration. And the moment we actually get saved, it's like that, that finding that treasure. Like you've seen, oh, wow, what an experience. And, um, you know, we heard the testament sister Bonolo who said, look, even if that back pain will not go, Lord, I will serve you till the end. That's a statement of consecration. You're literally saying, I am thine, O oh God. So at that point, but then from the point of salvation, every other thing that happens is through consecration. I mean, when we get sanctified, at that point, do you, you remember what happens when the second work of grace, when the Adamic nature, the inbred sin, you know, the sin principle, whatever we call it, that thing that, that gives that tendency that makes us to fight, that thing that really comes and, you know, creates that kind of thing, is actually done away with, is at the point of that, we're not confessing sins anymore. We're actually yielding our lives to God. We are consecrating. We are devoting our entire. We're setting ourselves apart to God and saying, God, if you've gone this for me, you give me that peace that passes all understanding, my whole life belongs to you. And as we actually even, I, you know, I didn't belong to the apostolic faith, but I believe, that means I wasn't saved in the apostolic faith, but I believe that I actually got sanctified without even knowing it. 
when I was, you know, when, in, 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 when, I, when I was initially saved. But when I came to the apostolic faith, it was literally endorsing and validating that experience. There is no one that is truly saved. Wherever you get it from, the next thing is you are actually giving your life to God. You are yielding your life to God. And as you yield, God does mighty things. So there are times when we may not understand the experience, but it's happened. Because when we advance in holiness, because some people may not even have heard it, we thank God so much for the apostolic faith because the word is not just rightly divided, but we have some good understanding of these, you know, of these things. But some people may not have the privilege we have, but if they have a heart that is truly hungry and thirsty after righteousness, God reveals it to them in one way or the other, and God really does that. So, you know, again... When we look at what happened in, in the sanctification experience, you know, as we're yielding, as we're saying, God, I'm all yours now, just, you know, you, we just feel there's just that kind of longing, that hunger, that desire to just say, God, just have all of me now, have all of me now. In that process, it sanctifies us. It just fills us with, with that love, with that perfect love, that perfect desire to serve me, fills us with that. And they were liking that when we look at the tabernacle proper, do you remember in that holy, they said the holy places, you know, they talked about um, it was actually overlaid with gold. All around it, within the places, all gold. When you talk about the golden candlestick, when we talk about the table of shoe, everything was actually gold. It, that means holiness is golden. Holiness is gold. Consecration is spiritual gold. It's something you, 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 you know, we, they were liking that you were literally sitting in there. You know, the priests, they go in there. Imagine when you're consecrated, going in there and having a taste of that showbread. That's when we're actually partaking of the bread of life. When we're eating that bread, partaking, as we're sitting down here, enjoying every bit of the sermon, every bit of the singing, every bit of the testimonies, everything. Even the announcements are blessed, aren't they? Everything. Everything. Even the smiles from, from the people of God, we just enjoy it. That is something we really very much cherish and it's something which is so, so wonderful to us. So as we, you know, in that holy place there, it's like you're sitting in heavenly places. You know, that tabernacle is simulating the presence of God. You're in there, just enjoying there, taking that in. That is through consecration. And, you know, they talked about the altar of um, incense where your prayers are going up. Those prayers that are going up are consecrated prayers. They are prayers where you are yielding your life. It's prayers that you're yielding. You're just yielding. Come on. We should understand as we de define it initially, it's about devoting yourself. It's about telling someone, you, I belong to you now and just have all of me. You're yielding, you're devoting, you're setting apart yourself. It's not just a prayer of, I want this. It's nothing to do with that. Consecration is about just yielding yourself, yielding your all, yielding. That is, and without it, we can receive nothing from God. It's very, very important that we understand that. And I'm sure the Lord will bless us Amen. as we see that. So that, that's a, a, as I said, it's an Asian landmark. For me, if there's anything that makes this church, when in my little experience, stand out in the way we structured everything, the fact we've got altar benches, we've got everything, is to enable us to consecrate. The way the services and everything is to create an atmosphere that even though we may not be praying on our knees, we actually have an atmosphere where consecration is taking place already. Because as you are meditating, as you are talking to God, you are, you are consecrating. And we create an environment for such a spirit to thrive. And we thank God so much for that. I mean, you know, as we kind of enjoy that and then to go into the holy of holies to, you know, the consecration is the root to go in there. That's the reason why, you know, some people get those frequent experiences just in one go, don't they? You know, they get saved. They just have that desire. We heard the wonderful testimony Sister Carol gave us into now, now two and a half hours. She just went just for God and said, God, just have all of me. I'm sure she was enjoying such a, a blissful time with God and God wonderfully baptized her with the Holy Ghost. So it's something that's intrinsic. It's that desire to really have the kind of pleasurable experience our first parents had. That's what God is trying to create for us. That is what we're enjoying. That's pretty much what is, it's not a daunting experience. That's the reason why we, we do all we can to kind of, um, you know, rightly divide the world where people can find their path through to salvation the proper way, where you can pray your way through. If you don't pray your way through and someone says, oh, somehow you've got saved and you don't really get saved, you've started your struggle already because you will claim what you don't really experience and then you will try and do what you can't really do. That's the reason why we exercise patience, even with our children, with our youth. It's true, we want them to get saved truly, and we believe the Holy Spirit's friends will do that. But we also recognize that it's the work of the Spirit. 
And sometimes we may hold on and just, you know, kind of exercise faith, exercise patience and keep praying till the Lord does it. Because when the Lord does it, it's so wonderful, isn't it? It's so, it's so glorious. It was a sister seller that testified um, recently when she said about Portland. Um, she talked about, um, she went into the tabernacle one day, sat down there and saw very young people, very, very young people just kind of just doing one thing or the other for the Lord. Picking up the songbooks, picking up the trash on the floor, you know, whatever and doing that. Just doing it voluntarily. It's consecration that gives birth to that. Consecration makes Christianity so beautiful, so attractive. It makes things, you people come in our midst and they just see just flowing. We don't force people, we actually allow the Holy Spirit. We persuade, no doubt. We encourage, we motivate, but, but above all, we allow the Holy Spirit to do that. Because we, only, we are only what we are through consecration. And may God consecrate us truly. And then, you know, Again, when we did the tabernacle thing, one thing that was beautiful about the old worship was it simulates exactly what we truly experience now. They said after the trespass often we take to the priest, there's one thing that they voluntarily do, and that's to give what they call a burnt offering. And that burnt, if we read um, in Leviticus 1, 2, and 3, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. It is an offering of a burnt sacrifice of the herd. Let him offer a meal without, without blemish. So shall he shall offer it to his own, of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Can we see that? It says of his own what? Voluntary. That burnt offering, and the burnt offering is a whole animal that they actually you know, give and they burn that whole animal. It shows that it's the whole of you. It's the whole of us that actually goes to God in consecration. And they said that burnt offering, they usually do it every morning, every evening. That's the continual nature of it. It's something you do all the time continually, and it's something that God blesses. It tells us that consecration is the offering of the whole life to God. It's not, it can't be partial. If that offering, the, the burnt offering was a partial one, maybe half of the animal or three quarters of it, it wouldn't be acceptable. So they, again, they're trying to typify that it's all or nothing. If you want to give God all, you give him all. You cannot say, God, take all of me. And that's where the beauty of Christianity actually emanates from. It's got to be total. Everything is definitely and voluntarily placed in God's hands and supreme will. That's what we do when we consecrate. We're literally saying, take everything, Lord. And that everything's prompted by the salvation experience. If we have a genuine salvation experience, it's a natural flow. It's a prompt that comes out of it. And as we actually continue that, the burnt offering is about continuity. Because sometimes we enjoy a fantastic salvation experience and we tend to rest on our oars. We might feel, oh, that's it, it's been great, I'm saved, sanctified, baptized. But that burnt offering, they say, you now continually put that offering there. Continue saying, the whole of me, the whole of me. That's why when you see truly successful Christians, if you go back, way back into church history and read about these wonderful saints of God that lived long, even before the apostolic faith, one thing that marked them out is consecration. Some of them, they didn't pray any other prayer than prayers of consecration. As they yielded and yielded and yielded and yielded, everything else followed. The Bible says, seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and its righteousness. Well, that is a place of consecration. As we're doing that, we're literally consecrating. He said, all those things you desire, the, our Father in heaven knows about them anyway, and he will bless us with them. Amen. And that's why consecration is an ancient landmark. Very, very important. If we grasp that concept, the Lord will bless us indeed. Now, the, the purpose of consecration. Um, consecration is simply recognizing Christ's ownership of me and saying to him, Lord, I am yours by right. I wish to be yours by choice. By right, we are his. Yeah. But because the, his, our free will, God will never take. But then we're now saying voluntarily, yeah. I am yours by choice. I'm yours by choice. That's what consecration is. We literally say, take me now. Take me now, Lord, I am yours by choice. Now, Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which walketh in you both to will <coughs> and to do of his good pleasure. Can we see that now? It's saying, now, if we give ourselves completely to God, God has a chance. 
He's, we're giving him the opportunity, we're giving him the privilege, not privilege, we're giving him the, his rightful chance to work in us. Then he will begin to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's what we're saying. So to know God's perfect will, the root to know God's perfect will is consecration. When we talk about God's will, I mean, even when we pray about things, we may have a desire. We may have one thing that we're asking from the Lord. But if we actually go down the route of consecration, when we're consecrating, God, we're allowing God to have a way of actually making what is, that will which we feel may not be God's perfect will. But when we consecrate, we will actually root ourselves through to God's perfect will in our lives. Yeah. Hebrews 13, 20 and, um, and 21. It says, now the God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Can we see that now? He's the one working in us yeah. to do that which is well-pleasing. It's God. So again, consecration, we're literally saying, I'm, not, I'm God. I can't figure this out. I can't do it. I don't. I will allow you to do. It. You figure it out for me. You you sort it out. It's your. It's your. It's you that can sort it out. No matter how much I think I can do, I can't. I'll mess it up. You sort it out. This is. We're not talking about being saved. That's after salvation. We're literally consecrating to say, God, you have your way. So that perfect term will. Now, very, very, very familiar scripture that we know, Romans twelve one and two, which talks a little bit, a lot about consecration. I beseech you, brethren. Um, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at that. It says reasonable to do that. The reason why it's re reasonable is before Romans 12 was Romans 1 to 11. And when we study Romans 1 to 11, it was all about actually glorifying the salvation experience glorifying justification by faith. In Romans 8, it talks about, therefore, there's now no more condemnation, isn't it, to them? That's if you've tasted all that, you've tasted the mercies of God. He said, by the mercies of God, we can, we can all stand up and say, God, thank you for being merciful to me. I was a sinner, but, but because of the proceeds of Calvary, I am what I am today. I'm saved by grace. So he's saying, by those mercies, present your bodies now. Say, consecrate yourself. Consecrate. Say, look at it. Look at what I've done for you. Look at this. Look, you know, go through what you've experienced, you know, through me. And then he said, now present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And as we present that, he's saying, that is the root. In Romans, um, if we continue, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So we want to know God's good and acceptable and perfect. Not just good, but acceptable. Not just acceptable, but perfect will of God. It can only be done through consecration. There is no other route to knowing it through consecration. Just yielding, just yielding our lives to God. Say, mold me and make me, isn't it? After your will. As we do that, we can prove it. Even whatever we're praying for, be it a job, be it a, you know, when we talk about marriage, it, you know, we're talking about, you know, you pray, you know, to get, but if you just consecrate your life, God will take care of the whole thing. Yeah. Consecration is holistic. Yeah. When we consecrate, it means everything you want to lay your hands on, God is in the picture. Yeah. He takes care of it. So, if there's anything you want to talk about, you know, someone might say, oh, you better pray about that job. No, if you're consecrated, you're effectively praying about the job. You pray about this, pray about a life partner, whatever. If you're a consecrated soul, you're effectively doing all that because you're literally saying, you know, all of me, Lord, just take control. You have your way in it. So he was appealing to them, to the Romans Christians, uh, by the message of God, why not do that? You know, you know, he said, a living sacrifice. You know, those sacrifices of all oh, were dead sacrifices. You know, the bulls and the goats and everything they killed. But then it was something that the, whole, the poor animal or whatever is literally just sacrificed. The whole of that animal becomes, you know, an object of sacrifice. They've got to kill it. They're saying, we're living, isn't it? We've got the spirit of God, but our, our body or, is dead on account of sin. He's saying, now living, because we are living now, continually be presenting yourself as a sacrifice. We are living, but continually let's be presenting ourselves. Just lay it on that altar. Lay it there and say, God, have your way 
in my life. You know, it's supposed to be voluntary, as I said. It's something we want to do so that we can understand God's perfect consecration, not doing God's will because we have to do it, but because we want to. Very important. It's true we have to. The Old Testament, the law of Moses says, thou shalt, isn't it? But the New Testament says, blessed are thou. Isn't it? He said, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. It means God created in such a way that we will naturally just want to. When we taste of the goodness of the Lord, you will naturally want to. So it's not, there's a very big difference, very big difference between a forced approach and a voluntary act. So consecration is something we voluntarily do. There is great joy in knowing God's will and doing it. We know that. There is great joy, but the only way to know it is through consecration, yielding our lives. In Psalm 48, David said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Could you see that? A delight. David said, well, I must, he didn't say I must do your will. Oh, okay. I, I want to make heaven say I must do your will. It wasn't that. No. He said, I delight. There is a natural longing to do God's will. He said, I, I delight to do it. Because he was fully consecrated and God's will, you just want it. You want nothing but God's will in one's life. Romans um, 6.13 said, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. This is, we're talking again about how we consecrate, but just a little bit more on that. It, it, it's a kind of yielding, isn't it? You're yielding, said, not as members, you know, you can yield to sin, isn't it? Yielding can be in two ways. Now that one is saved, he's saying, yield your members. That's, the Bible says somewhere, mortify your flesh, isn't it? Deeds in the body. Mortify, mortify means you're consecrating. You're literally saying, Paul said, I die daily. Do you remember? You are denying the self within you all the time. We recognize that all the time, our best intentions may still be vanity. Our best intentions may not be endorsed or validated by God. No matter how much we wish it, but that's why we're yielding all the time there's nothing wrong in telling god i desire to do desire to do that but we're making that secondary we're putting consecration on top of that and so saying but nevertheless thy will not by will be done that's what we're telling god and as we do that we can actually enjoy the goodness of god they in um, luke 9 23 says if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me you know that deny that you're denying you, you know, we all have the self within us. As long as we remain in this, you know, clay, there's that self is still there. I may desire one thing, but consecration enables me to deny it. It enables us to feel that, God, I, I will keep denying myself. I will keep denying my own self-ambitions, my own self, the self that so that you can have your way, so that you can either endorse what I feel is right. You might say, yeah, that's it. That's my will for you. Oh, no, this is what I have for you. You're allowing God to be supreme in your life. That is what um, consecration does for us. We literally say we die to our own plans and live to the will of God. I mean, some people say it's like letting go. When we do let go, just let go, let go. That's consecration about letting go allow God to let go, no matter how we may feel we're spiritual, if we don't daily let go, we may have a thought, we may have a desire, we may have a, you know, a, a, an opinion. If we don't let go, we are not consecrated. When we let go, God will have his way. And as God has his way, we can be truly blessed. The beauty of holiness is the beauty of consecration. You can't, holiness cannot be beautified without consecration. Constant consecration beautifies holiness. It makes holiness to be kind of real, and it makes people to be able to actually feel it. It makes it very tangible, even to those who actually look at our lives. You know that song we sang, Take My Life and Let It Be. Consecrated what? All to you. A verse says, take my intellect and use. Always only for you. Take my lips and let me sing beautifully for you. That's consecration. You say, you say, take my voice, take my everything that you're submitting. You know, you might be, we might be anything. We might be so talented, but you're literally submitting those talents to God. You're not just, because you, one could acknowledge, but not submit. 
So it's not just about acknowledging that God gave me the time, but you're submitting it. God, have your way. Do whatever, whatever. And God, where he can begin to put his finger on different things in terms of what. So if we haven't got that total submission, we can't fully enjoy God. We can't fully be used of God in the way it is. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Imagine that. Ceaseless praise. Let them keep going. So the, the, the hymn suggests the, the extent of consecration. It's a manifestation of real consecration in personal and practical life through so everything you can think of is literally what you are submitting to God. Another song that comes to mind, or even before that, when we're consecrated, we're saying to God, God, purify me, mold me, shape me. That's what we're saying. Say, thou art the potter, isn't it? Like, you know, that makes the clay. I am the clay. You're literally saying every day, every moment, look, God, even in spite of my brilliance, in spite of my knowledge of the gospel, in spite of my whatever you are, you're saying thou art the potter. That's what enables sometimes certain things happen are painful. We don't like it, but when we consecrate, we just say thy will, O Lord, be done. We, it may bring much tears, but then we consecrate means God, have your way, O God. How thine own way, that's what characterizes the old time religion. When we talk about sound doctrine, this is what it's all about. Honestly, this is what's all, these are the foundations of sound doctrine. That's what it's all about. Without consecration, we can't do anything. Every other thing falls apart. Salvation, sanctification, baptism, whatever, all the doctrines we quote fall apart. They don't have any value without consecration. It's the root to receive everything and anything from God. It's the root to have that continuity with God as we actually desire to serve him. So, you know, there's some, some, some examples in, in the Bible. When we, when we look at the case of um, Paul in, in, in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, it but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. One thing we notice about Paul here is it was a voluntary offer. He didn't kind of say, it, it, the, the, the Bible says the love of God constraineth us. He was constrained by the Lord. He said by the knowledge of the excellency of Christ. That beauty of what he's saying. He said everything he knew in the Jewish religion, the tradition, all the kind of um, the, the schooling under Gamaliel and where that would have got him to, the prestige, the fame that would have given him the religious you know, kind of um, setup of those days, said he considered but don't, you know, kind of abandoned all that for the excellency that is consecration. He literally said, look, for the excellency of knowing Christ, and if we need to be able to kind of say, God, whatever I am, whatever I was, I want to abandon that, and you just have your way. Amen. Let you work out your will in my life. Amen. You have a way in my life. That is what's going to make the gospel to thrive. The, the, the success of the gospel anywhere and everywhere is, is determined by the number of consecrated people. When we have consecrated people, the gospel is guaranteed to thrive. It's guaranteed to fly. Without consecrated people, the gospel would not go any further. May God give us consecrated souls. May God bless us with consecrated, that wholehearted consecration. When we look at the case of um, um, Job, it said, Naked came in Job 121, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can't, all his possessions taken away, and everything, and that came out, it's because he was consecrated. It's the, it's, it, that was a test if it was fully consecrated or not. That's what it simply was. Because when we're consecrated, it will be tested. And then when the, Job found the test, he could alter. It wasn't something he pre-planned. It was something that came out because he had already learned on a daily basis to consecrate his life. So when that havoc, that disaster happened, he had no choice to say, well, you know, you slay, though you slay me, yeah, will I still trust you? Sometimes, you know, we're cast down. We are, you know, we're just listening. We're, we're there in tears and everything. But we're saying, I am yours, God. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is what consecration actually does for us. Look at the case of Abraham. When Abraham left the whole Mesopotamia, when God said, get thee out of thy country. After he was said, get thee out of thy kingdom and go all the way, you know, to a land he will show him. That was consecration. To be able to make that move. Before the offer of Isaac, he had been consecrating his life. Before God then asked him, offer thine only son. It was a test of his consecration. And the only reason why he could pass that test was he was fully consecrated. So we can't look at the, some of these scriptures within, out of context. We need to get the context 
the context of that was the trial. It was a trial of, is he really cons fully consecrated or not? We can't pass such a test if we're not fully consecrated. We're going to mumble, we're going to groan, we're going to mumble, we're going to do everything. But if we're fully consecrated, then we may bring lots of tears. But we'll just say, God, hands up. Have your way. That's what consecration will enable us to do. Consecration is really beautiful. It, it, it's beautiful. When, when, when we become a consecrated child of God, we have crucified the flesh with its affections and loss. That's because pretty much some of the things that people get entangled with and some of the stuff that shouldn't be named among Christians is due to lack of consecration. If we are continually yielding our lives, continually mortifying the flesh, the lust of the flesh and its affections will not come our way. Because we're literally killing that all the time. Amen. We're literally, you know, so we're consecrating all the time. We're not, because the consecration of today will not survive for tomorrow. Yeah. It's a daily exercise. Yeah. And as we keep doing that, we will be victorious. Amen. We will live victorious Christian lives. Amen. And suffering with Christ is easily borne by the consecrated soul. That, that's it. Suffering will come. It's the Lord of the Christians. You imagine in, in, in among the Beatitudes, somewhere in Matthew 5, he said, when they persecute you, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Because he knew these were consecrated people. Uh, they are consecrated. Th that which motivates them and drives them is internal. It's intrinsic. It's the love of God that's actually constrained them, that enables them to be able to do that. And you know, one thing about, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, the, or the, there's one of our tracks talks about when you want to know the, the beauty of um, a, a, a petrol, just crush the petal, that, that fragrance that comes out of it. When you crush the life of a Christian, sometimes when, you, you know, maybe someone misjudges you and your reaction to it is going to, what's going to determine your reaction is if you're fully consecrated, you will react in a Christ-like manner. Oh, yeah. If you're not fully consecrated, your Adamic nature might have even come back. And then you actually, you know, the flesh takes over. And we don't want that. Consecration is the only route to sustain our experiences. Oh, yeah. It's the only route to actually enjoy the unity which we enjoy as children of God. Without consecration, we can't. You know, in Romans 12, after that, if you read Romans 12 from verse 3 downwards up to verse 6, let me make chapter 6 now, I think, there, there was a lot that Paul was saying after they say you yield, you know, you, um, your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Then he talked about be not conformed to what that we may not perish. Then he began to say some things about avenge not evil, bless them that persecute you. He talked about um, um, show mercy with cheerfulness, love, um, let love be genuine. Give to the saints, hospitality, associate with the lowly, repay no evil for evil, never avenge yourselves. Because he could say that because he knows that will be an outflow of a consecrated life. So when you're consecrated, then, yeah, you can freely love your enemies. You can freely do good to those who persecute you. You can freely, even if maybe for whatever reason in the home, maybe two people have been saved before, for whatever reason the enemy came in the way and someone's lost it, and they begin to behave in a certain way, actually, you who've got it will be able to bear it. That is, that, that's, consec without consecration, it wouldn't be possible because the reality is, consecration keeps us and shields us in this present world. The Bible says, it was it in John 17, it said, I pray that, not that you take them out of the world, isn't it? We'll be in the world. So after being sanctified, to preserve sanctification, consecration is the tool to preserve it. Otherwise, the world that is harsh out there will keep beating at us, will keep throwing their darts, throwing all sorts at us, and we'll lose it. But when we're consecrated, we will be able to continually exercise a Christ-like life, and God will give us um, the victory. A life of prayer naturally leads up to full consecration. Again, you can't be prayerless and be consecrated because consecration simply means you are prayerful. But I don't necessarily mean in the, the kind of, um, the, I mean you've got a praying heart you, because all the time you're whispering, you are thinking, you, you actually just, you, you may be going to work, you are literally just still yielding your life. You're still yielding, you're yielding. You're saying, God, mold me, make me as things, you know, affect you, maybe challenges in the workplace, challenges at home, challenges everywhere. We're actually having that praying attitude all the time. So they're saying, God, and that's what's going to keep us. Because even as Christians, we're going, to hurt each, we're going to step on each other's toes. But with consecrated lives, you know, we will call, forgive each other. Oh, yeah. We'll forbear with one another. Oh, yeah. 
you know, we will forgive because that's what's going to keep it there. But if we are not keep on saying, not my will, but yours, our will will then come up. And when our will comes up, the whole thing is messed up. Then people come in and can't really enjoy. We may preach one thing and people may not be able to actually see the real thing. Consecration is what enables people to kind of behold the beauties of Christianity. And we pray God to make us consecrated. In, 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 in closing, Matthew 5, 48, said, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That was something, you know, after the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, in verse 44, he knew that if he has consecrated people, because literally you're aiming for God's perfect will. Consecration is the root to perfection. We're talking about um, 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 spiritual perfection now. Consecration is the root to it. And we want to be perfect people. It's don't figure it out yourself. No. God is not saying, oh, yeah, I want to be perfect or start counting. Okay, yeah, I'm not that good at this. We're not perfect in dynamics. Our humanity is still there. But what you say, yield, keep yielding, keep yielding. Just say, mold me, make me, have it all, have it all, Lord. He will figure it all out. He will sort it all out for us. He will mold us into such a beautiful thing. We'll be so beautiful that we'll behold one another and we'll be praising God. We'll be longing for eternity. We'll feel, look, what's the best group of people to be among than the people of God? We want to go anywhere, be it Zimbabwe, Portland, anywhere we want to go to, Nigeria, and we want to actually be able to see people of like-mindedness, that we actually speak the same language. We love the same way. We are different. I'm not talking about perspective might be different and things like that, but at least that common denominator that we're people who are humble. Where people who have actually completely said, God, have your way. God, have your way completely. That is consecration. And may God consecrate us. If you're unsaved, God wants to consecrate. He wants to save you. And you can start on that road of consecration. And those of us who are saved, we want to make our conscience unreserved. It has to be unreserved. It's a whole burnt off. We want to say, God, all of you are nothing. As we come to pray and sing the closing song, may God help us to consecrate this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege you've given us once again to yield our all to you as we gather around this altar and everywhere, and we're looking up to you, asking you to take perfect control of our life, surrendering and submitting and sacrificing and just leaving everything for you. We pray that fire will fall from heaven to consume our consecration, to accept our offerings and bless us with salvation sanctification, Holy Ghost and fire, healing and all the desires of our heart. Thank you because we know you are going to do more than we can think or ask as we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.